Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, what archaeology can teach us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of archaeologists who work in the Middle East to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University. And normally, uh, my co-host is here, Dr. Larry Garrity. He is on assignment. And we are privileged, again, uh, Dr. Kent Bramlett, Associate Professor of Archaeology and the History of Antiquity at La Sierra, to have you as part of this uh, ongoing conversation about the Bible, archaeology in the Bible, especially since we kind of in invented and then began this process of going book by book. It's given us a chance, I think, to review a number of things and to explore some new things. At least it has for me. So it's been exciting. Thank you. For to bring the part. worlds together, the biblical world, the world of archaeology. And those are two worlds that we live in and we love and we're happy to work at bringing them together. Mm -hmm. Even if sometimes they don't fit as tidily as we'd like, it is pulling them together in ways that I think will open some windows of discovery for us, and that's what we want to do. We are in the Psalms. This is the third episode on the Book of Psalms. We talked, first of all, about music and musical instruments, and then we turned to basically the forms, literary forms of Psalms, primarily hymns and laments. Poetry, before we turn to this one, which is more theological. Poetry, there's poetry, I mean, the book of Psalms is poetry. And there's poetry everywhere in the Old Testament and some in the New. Why is that such an important medium for communicating written text, especially from ancient times? Well, scholars debate the extent of literacy in the ancient world. And while we know literacy is increasing uh, throughout the Old Testament period, um, most people, even if they could read, wouldn't be able to have written text before them. It's, it's just not that easy to produce. Right, right. And so uh, poetry is a way of remembering. And uh, it's not only the, uh, the Psalms that are in, in poetic form, but if we look at sort of ethnographic studies that might illustrate uses of poetry, think of the Arabian traditions of um, recitation of histories, oral histories in the form of poetry. Or genealogies. Genealogies as well, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think um, certainly one of the functions of poetry is to aid memory, memorization. And of course another is simply the, the effect it has on us. Mm -hmm. Our hymns, our songs are usually uh, in some form of poetry as well, set to music. And maybe we should have said something about this in the episode we talked about hymns and laments, but. Mm -hmm. Now is a good time since we're talking about poetry. Hymns build a lilting positive rhythm and meter so that one actually is physically, totally, holistically lifted. Whereas laments have a meter that actually is a downer. It's, it's part of the meter of the poetry itself. So it's not just reading the words like we do privately or even like we do on this program. It's capturing the meter and the rhythm and the beat. Not much rhyme, but lots of meter. And, and that captures us holistically. Right, and most ancient poetry, uh, it's not about rhyme. It's about alliteration, the sounds, the meter, the rhythms. Um, English, because we've lost all the, the grammatical endings, which makes rhyming sort of uh, passe. Right. Um, now we rely on that more than most times. Right, right. In the past. Uh, I do wonder if uh, in an oral society, if we could just think about being in a society where we read very little, certainly read privately very little, um, how much more significant poetry and poetic hymn and lament singing would actually be. Not just to the feelings that all of this emotes, but rather to this, the, the theological content as well. And we might actually mm. capture something more if we paid attention and pretended that we were an oral culture and right. learned something. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. I mean, it's, think of Homer in the Greek traditions. Again, the poetry is the vehicle to convey all sorts of messages. All right. And so as we look at the Psalms, I think we can sort of begin to unpack that uh, component. Right, and, and hopefully even think about it more holistically. Right. Not mm -hmm. just kind of a left brain cognitive sort of analysis, but these were life-changing experiences. 
and the poetry is in part what does it. Mm -hmm. And of course, if most of the Bible, like a number of scholars would say, and I'm one of them, that um, most of the Bible comes to us initially in oral form. I mean, even the book of Revelation, blesses is the one who reads and those mm -hmm. who hear. So I think we ought to take that as a model for pretty much most mm -hmm. of scripture. And it might, if we would kind of think about practicing that once in a while, it might actually open some uh, new avenues for discovery. Could be. So this time uh, on this episode, we talk about theology. We're talking about God and the gods. We're talking about how God is depicted in the book of Psalms, which ranges for, what, several centuries, we would it say? It does. It's a collection that is built over the right. life of the, right. the second temple and beyond, the and first temple and And different beyond. perspectives, so we should mm -hmm. expect a bit of uh, diversity here. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the process, um, we're going to explore what the book of Psalms says and what different authors say about God. And then we want to compare that with the wider world. And maybe the wider world can help us understand why some descriptors for God are used in the Psalms. I think that's where archaeology can really contribute. We, we hope so. We hope so. Before we get there, though, we have some artifacts in front of us, actually some really interesting ones, some of which uh, we've had before, but uh, many of which we have not. Just about everything here <laughs> is related to temple. And it's worship. related to worship, isn't it? <clears throat> Well, um, one of my favorites right here in the middle, uh, it's this bronze shovel called a machta in Hebrew. And this would be used to bring coals from the large sacrificial altar in the courtyard to bring coals into the, the temple. And probably then they, they placed on the incense stands in front of the, um, well, if it's a pagan temple, the images of the deity. Right. We think that's how these function. But all of these uh, vessels are very important. Look at this, for example. This is a, a chalice, basically a, a footed bowl. Again, very common and popular uh, for presenting libations, incenses, so liquid and liquids offerings. many times. Uh, the perforated vessels we call incense burners, even though we don't find evidence of blackening on the inside. Nevertheless, they're usually interpreted somehow for the air to the circulate air flow, through. Right. right. Um, animal figurines, human figurines, variously interpreted, but usually connected with worship or cult. Of, some of them some may be way. more tied to domestic as opposed mm. to public worship settings. Would we say the figurines, uh, especially the uh, human um, figurines? There's certain kinds of them. Mm. Some kinds we find oh, in we temples right. as temple. votives. Exactly. Yeah, yeah the one we excavated. Right. We'd find these as votives left behind probably to perpetuate the prayers. Others we find in tombs. We find them in household contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, maybe bringing <coughs> an aspect of the deity back with the individual. Good. Then we have lamps, which are typical. Right. of lots of uh, uses in the ancient world, mm. but certainly in Practical, worship context. Practical, symbolic. V very much so. Mm. Very much. And the Psalms in particular. Uh, we have that. And then here, three pieces, actually four, of different, uh, these may actually be part of the same one, um, what we call model shrines. We're going to see a completed one uh, on the slides. These were excavated at our site. Um, they are clearly not what, a bowl or Clearly not. a jar? You, you can see the fenestrations or the windows cut into them. Um, that wouldn't function very well for containing wet or dry goods. And, and we wouldn't have anything like this put the on angles. a wheel because we've got the angles. Mm. Now this one has the windows, the fenestration, mm. so a fenestrated stand In a circular of some form. Mm. In a circular form. These would be more of a small box. Mm. And then a lion, well, okay. <clears throat> that's what we're going to It's, that's it's what we're fun to uh, look, try to determine the sort of creator. This was creator attached to one of these uh, model shrines and attached in such a way that it marked the entry. Standard for uh, protecting deities and royalty. And symbolic of the qualities sometimes of deities. True. True. And then a very small one, and we'll let the uh, camera come close to that one. It is a a hand drum, and one, it's broken, it's what we excavated at our site, 
and it's got one hand that's clearly it's operating, mm -hmm. and then the other one is grasping, is holding. Yep. And so that, that's, I mean, okay, it's just a little piece, but it, it's precious. We really like that. It has a lot to do with music in worship, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's important part of it. Okay, so let's take a look then at the book itself, <clears throat> and we're going to think about uh, especially the theological side of Psalms and see where we can get some archaeological input in that whole process. Uh, we've talked about the outline basically marked out by the um, little notes at the end of these chapters, uh, 41, 72, etc. And then some issues. We do want to think about the existence of other deities. There's a sense in which people rather automatically say, that God in the Bible throughout is perceived uh, as in, in a monotheistic way, which means one God, no others. That's what monotheism, at least theologically speaking, that's how it's used. It's interpreted. It's yeah, interpreted. Or defined. Right. So we have a couple of other words here in the second line. Polytheism, many deities. Mm -hmm. Monism, or what's Some another term? Some people use the term henotheism. Which is a Greek way of saying... Yeah, there's... Well, actually, they're both Greek. You're <coughs> worshiping or recognizing one God among Others. a plurality. I mean, the Ten Commandments begin in a way that might suggest that's at least how a good deal of the Old Testament... And we it. know that among the, uh, the ordinary people, uh, they wouldn't be worshiping other gods if they didn't think that they existed. So clearly, right. the struggle is to only worship Yahweh. That's right. Which is monism or heno, um, henotheism, right? And then, of course, monotheism, which does come in the Old Testament. <coughs> yeah. I, I don't know if I could say relatively late, but probably so. It's certainly uh, not the beginning point and not through most of the middle, not through most of the monarchy. It's kind of toward the end of that. And so then we have something that focuses more on one God, there are no others. We have that in Isaiah mm -hmm. uh, 45. And then we'll be looking at some non-monotheistic characteristics in the book of Psalms, like the divine assembly, divine council, the use of the plural, us, we. I mean, even in Genesis, you have that. And then we'll, uh, we'll think about the name Elohim. Is that singular or plural, the name Elohim? Well, it's grammatically <coughs> plural. And there's been debates, the origins of it. I mean, some people have said it's the plural of majesty. That's more how it is used once monotheism is, is recognized. Right, right. But what are the origins of it? Well, there are times when Elohim is still used for gods when it's referring to And pagan translated deities. that way occasionally mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. So, And then sons of God, um, typically we have kind of a uh, you know, people who are adopted by God and loved by God and they are the children of God. But this is what kind of term? Well, in certainly Canaanite texts, Ugaritic texts, the Bnei Elohim are uh, other, what should we call it? They're below the high gods, but they're part of that heavenly uh, council or the council of, of the gods. So in, what, so in a Greek context, they'd be up on Mount Olympus, but okay. they wouldn't be the high gods. <laughs> so somehow divine, or at least Close. Close. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at some texts in Psalms, and then we want to look at these external ones and see what we can learn from both. Um, some references here to uh, passages in Psalms that refer to sons of God or Elohim or um, the use of the plural. Mm -hmm. There's another possibility that scholars have suggested that, that you might have a text that would kind of spring from um, an ancient society around ancient um, Israel, but then would be spun. Um, names would be changed. And then mm. God would be the one who is, in, is being celebrated rather than Baal or somebody else. Or an appropriation or reapplication. Right. See, I think that happens more often than we even imagine. Many of our hymns, right? I've our been told Amazing hymns. Grace started in the, what, the bar halls? Well, certainly the, 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 the work of Charles Wesley. He frequented the pubs not because he was drinking. I mean, he was one of the early becoming the Methodists and mm -hmm. taking care of those things. Mm -hmm. But he was um, looking for music that would make for hymns. And so you use the music that everybody knew. This, there was no secret. Nobody said, oh, I wonder where that came from. Everybody knew. 
but putting new words to it added an interesting sparkle. And I think that happens a lot. In fact, I think we're going to see some psalms that might be influenced in that way and would be positive. We'll also see um, the creation hymns. We'll look at those because in those, God is um, fighting against something else or someone else. And we want to look at the, at the uh, Babylonian parallels to that. Psalm 29 is an interesting place to start. Kent, this is not a long reading. <clears throat> Good way to begin. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So, heavenly beings. What's the word? What's the Hebrew behind it? The B'nai Elohim. The B'nai Elohim, the sons of sons God. Sons of God. So change that then. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of God, mm -hmm. who are either divine or quasi-divine or getting close to or brushing up against divinity. Something like that. They're members of the heavenly realm. Of the heavenly realm. Maybe the council. We'll talk about that. Sons of God are used in Job as a heavenly council. Mm -hmm. the sons of yeah, well, God and it gather. certainly enters Christ, uh, Christian theology and becomes interpreted, at least, oh, there's you know, medieval traditions. Um, Milton picks this up in Paradise Lost, but it becomes an assembly where created beings come together yeah. and worship. Yeah. So I think this is going to be an intriguing kind of comparison we have here. Psalm 82, let me read this one. This is a psalm of, of Asaph, probably late. Um, in fact, the, the, the cluster of Asaph, or sons of Asaph psalms, probably comes from a bit later. Um, <clears throat> God has taken his place in the divine council. Mm -hmm. Taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, Elohim, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Pause. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Give justice to the weak and the orphan. And so out of this meeting of the divine assembly kinds, comes a kind of a decision. Let's make sure we take care of the poor. And it's, and it's, and it's a council decision. This is interesting. It is. This is not monotheism, however we think about it. Monism, perhaps, or maybe there's something else. Maybe there's some sort of um, um, poetic way of describing God in a greater, more powerful, more acceptable sense. I don't know. But it, there, it does seem that there's some tie here between this and what the uh, other sources are going to talk about with the Divine Council. We can certainly see where it's coming from right. when we look at the other texts. I think you're right. One would have to look at sort of the... Um, the, the meaning that comes out of it through the use in the Psalms, right. and that's a little bit harder to ascertain. Right, right, right. Well, when we look at some other characteristics, we might be able to tie that into, especially when God is described as stirring up nature. I mean, where does that come from? Well, maybe mm -hmm. that comes from these parallels, right. and it's using that language, but to say, no, this is not Marduk, this is not Baal, mm -hmm. this God is your God. is subsuming all of the language right. which is attributed right. to various gods right. in the surrounding cultures. I, I actually think that, at least for me personally, that's one of the major lessons mm -hmm. in the Psalms from comparing uh, them with archaeology. Mm -hmm. So, Psalm 89. Kent, tell us what this one's about. This one is late. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, the B'nai Elohim, is like the Lord? A God feared in the council of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are around him. Now, this one, the holy one, the term holy one, comes from Kadosh. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's left out there, and I'm not sure how we understand that. That may be something that at least people in later times would associate with angels. I don't know that they did then. I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. We don't walk. We know much more about angelology in the intertestamental period. Between the two testaments, yeah. exactly. Exactly. But so we have heavenly beings, and we have um, the, the holy ones in this one. So Psalm 95, for the Lord is great, and a great king above all gods. Why not, why not just say the way we believe it? <laughs> why not just say a great king above all the peoples? Mm. No, this is more powerful. If you thought there are other gods out there, not to worry. Our God is bigger. 
is above them. I just have to insert, it reminds me when I traveled in Burma, learning about when the Buddhist missionaries went to Burma trying to convert the locals and the local deities that were worshipped, the gnats, the spirits, they couldn't get rid of those traditions, so they finally came back and said, okay, those are down here, Buddha's up here, and that worked. So it made it part way. I think the Hebrew Bible we see it's coming the eventually right. displaces them entirely. Right, right, right. But yeah, it's this hierarchical placement initially. Hmm. That's a good illustration, good reminder. So we have some things going here, and we've got some uh, dry land, uh, depths of the earth, uh, the mountains, and so on. <clears throat> Now, Psalm 8, this isn't all of it, but uh, share these verses. The first verse, the first one is the first verse, the last line is the last verse, and then this interesting line in the middle. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Yet you have made him, mankind, a little less than God, or Elohim, and crown him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's just a wonderful psalm. It's only a few verses long. But in the middle, the way we normally read this is that God has made people a little lower than the angels, mm -hmm. which comes from the Septuagint, I think. I think so. As it's tran translated into Greek, uh, I'm not sure the translators could kind of stay with the idea that we've got God or gods. Uh, at right. Work there are some theological developments yeah, that occur yeah. with translations with in translations. antiquity. That's right. Nobody is without bias. Uh, right. as they do this work. So this is an interesting one too. You've made humankind, you know, just a little bit less than gods. A lot of ancient Near Eastern literature puts humans in sort of the cosmic, in their cosmic place. Right. And we see these hierarchical developments, animals and, and humans to be workers for the deity. Right. Uh, and here, and this is elevating. It, it's elevating right, humans right. above what you, where you would find them in Mesopotamian right. cosmologies. And I think if we did not pull that central verse out of its context, if we read all of the rest of the psalm, I think we could see that very thing going on. That, we're, yeah. that God is elevating humans higher than surrounding um, worshiping groups would. It's a good point. So, some artifacts. Okay, so some figurines. Uh, we've seen some on the table. Uh, we will look at a model shrine. Um, some religious or cultic vessels. We've talked about those, um, domestic and public worship. And cult stands, we've looked at those. We'll also see one here. Now, this picture actually represents something we excavated at Tel el Amari in Jordan, part of our project. And it's not complete. It is a model shrine. And you can see by the scale stick, that's what, about... Uh, uh, four inches or so, it's 10 centimeters, about four inches. Um, and then we've got um, an opening here, a doorway flanked by two, um, we're not sure if they're female or male, they've got kind of parts of both, it's a, an odd sort of thing going on here. But in any case, this type of, um, of representation of the location of deity would somehow be tied to worship services. What, maybe more in domestic? Than probably. In it's probably sort of a miniature temple in, in some way, and the deity would be, model would be placed inside and probably offerings brought right. to it. Right. Now, the Divine Council. You know this person. Heiser. Well, yes. <laughs> Michael Heiser. I went to, at a conference once, I was, I went to his presentation. He was talking about work he was doing with Ugaritic. Mm -hmm. I was the only one in the audience. <laughs> so he looks at me and says, so shall I, shall I, do you want to hear it? I said, yeah. <laughs> so we had a nice exchange. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah he's, a, he's an interesting person. So we have actually quite a bit of literature. This one is a standby by um, Theodore Mullen on the Assembly of the Gods, doing the same thing we're doing, uh -huh. comparing the biblical with the extra biblical texts. And then this relief from, um, from Babylon, 9th century, Shamash is the god of... Well, Shams, uh, Shamash, of the, of the sun. The sun. Mm -hmm. And so evidently, in some kind of assembly going on here, discussion, Maybe taking a vote, maybe making a decision to pay more attention to the poor. Could be. You wonder if this under kind of the thing. auspices, under the careful watch of the deity. Uh, right. Here pictured as the sun. Yes. We've seen this before on this program. I put it on here because of at least at the popular level, but this must have been this must have been more public because it is a stand that would be used in a public worship setting. Where you have a male Yahweh and probably Asherah, something like that. So at least at the popular level, some people were already thinking more widely. 
Maybe that's why the prophets came so unglued about right, this. Right, for several problem. centuries. Right, right. So we do have some texts, um, the stories of uh, Baal and Anat, that's Canaanite, the palace of Baal, Enuma Elish is uh, Babylonian. Right. So we'll only have a, a chance to look at part of this, but can't read this for us. Listen to me, mighty Baal. Hear me, hear me out, rider of the clouds. Now is the time for you to strike. Slay your enemies and eliminate your rivals. Now is the time to found an everlasting kingdom. Establish your dominion throughout all generations. So we have clouds, we read about those. Uh, we've got rivals and kingdoms and so on. Um, Baal proclaimed, I alone rule the divine assembly. Divine assembly shows up everywhere. So this is, this is in the air, I think, pretty much everybody in the Middle East breathed aware yeah. of this, this notion. It was part of the conceptual framework. It was. If you're a polytheist, that's no problem. If what you're do you moving do with toward it? monism or whatever, then that's more problem. How do you reframe the, yeah. the this was meaning a, this of this? Was, we ought to give more credit to the Bible writers for I taking so. something and actually attempting to do something that it, with it that's redemptive in their context and say something good about God. Using a metaphor everybody knew, but now saying something about their mm -hmm. God. I think it's a challenge. I think Asherah responds. Uh, then Asherah said, the sea spoke, make Athtar the awesome king. Let Athtar the awesome become king. Athtar the awesome climbed Mount Zaphon, the north. He ascended the throne of Baal, the almighty. So Athtar the awesome resigned. I cannot serve as king. I cannot dwell on the heights of Mount Zaphon. Now I put it here, well this is an interesting uh, poem anyway, but Mount Zaphon, the mountain of the north. Um, Psalm 48 talks about the mountain of the north and the coming with singing unto Zion, um, the mountain of the north, transplanting Zaphon to Jerusalem. Right. Um, very but it's clever. Still, it, it is very move. clever. And it's, it is north. And we won't have time to get to the picture of the mountain, but there is a mountain. It's the name Jebel... Um, Jebel al Akra in, al -Akra. in, 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 in Arabic. And Mount it's right Cassius on the Syrian coast. In classical times, yes. which actually comes from the Hurrian name for it. But Zaphon in Canaanite. And so, a, a real mountain. It is. And a mountain 5, that... 5,600 feet and the, the, in elevation, the, but right by the sea, so yeah. it's very dramatic. And Israelites would look to the north mm -hmm. and would know that, mm -hmm. but now they transplant this whole huge redemptive idea to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Um, I think we may have time to catch one more. Well, there's the psalm that brings that out. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Um, Mount Zion, down the fifth line mm. in the far north. Mount Zaphon, city of the great king. We sing this song. It's a we terrific do. song. And now that great king has become greater. It's in Jerusalem. Thank you, Kent. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope this has provided something for you to think about and something to increase your faith. And we do look forward to the next episode. Until then, think ancient, keep exploring, and keep believing. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.